Hi, I'm Alan Boswell, and welcome to The Horn, a podcast from the International Crisis Group. Today I'm joined in the studio by Judd Devermont. Judd served as a senior Africa official at the National Intelligence Council under the Obama administration, and he's now the Africa director at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. Judd also hosts the Into Africa podcast. I wanted to talk with Judd about how U.S. policy towards the Horn of Africa has shifted under the current Trump administration. But we'll also take a wider look at America's approach to the Horn of Africa, both past and present. Judd, welcome to the podcast. Happy to be here. Thank you. So, Judd, you worked at the senior levels of the Obama administration. How have you seen policy change towards this region since the new Trump administration came in? Thanks, Alan. I think we first have to start with how does this U.S. administration frame U.S. policy more broadly for the region? Then I think we can talk about the Horn of Africa. So the Obama administration had these you know, four big pillars. They're not surprising. Strengthening democratic institutions, peace and security, development, and then economic and trade investment. And for a brief period of time, there was this unhappy marriage between that framework and the Trump framework, which hadn't really been built. And then finally, we got this big reveal in December of 2018. And they dropped down to really three objectives, which was trade investment, peace and security, and then stability, which became a catch all for development. And depending on what document you read, governance. But in reality, there's only really two objectives, which is trade investment and great power competition. What's happened, though, in this region, unlike in the unlike in the Obama administration, has been there's been such an uptick in events that it's had to draw their attention into these other issues that really aren't part of the doctrine of the Trump administration, which is really governance, peace and security, and transition, whether we're talking about Sudan or Ethiopia. Now, you mentioned the 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 rolling out of the new Africa strategy. And of course, that was done by President Trump's uh, former national security advisor, John Bolton. The focus of that speech really was pegged on countering China and Russia, you know, the great power competition, as you as you mentioned. I mean, many Africans, I think, want to know why the U.S. is primarily focusing on Africa as a, a theater for great power competition, um, you know, rather than the world's fastest growing continent, a continent with which has many longstanding partners with the U.S. Um, fair? Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, as you know, they mentioned... John Bolton mentioned China, what, 15 times in the actual speech, rarely talked about Africa. I think one of the only countries in Africa that they mentioned, at least sub-Saharan Africa, was South Sudan, and that was to uh, really beat it up uh, for its its leadership, maybe maybe deserved, but um, this administration is the most minimalist I have ever seen since the end of the Cold War on Africa. During the Cold War, where the framing again was about great power competition, um, each administration focused on that, but you had different uh, approaches. So, and it, it didn't correspond necessarily partisan uh, party politics. But under a president like Kennedy, it was we're going to do all of these things to achieve our goals: that governance, democracy, investment, development. All of those things are important. President Kennedy met with an African leader on average once a month for his three years in office. But then you would have Johnson, who went back to we're strictly going to focus on countering the Soviet Union move to the end of the Cold War, and every administration, Bush, Obama, Bush, Clinton, all of them had this big maximalist approach to what we're doing in Africa. But it's minimalist. I mean, again, we're back to just this larger geopolitical rift. And I think that if we were in other regions, we would feel the same. So I don't know if they're picking on Africa. I think this is a problem across the globe. And John Bolton spoke to what all the documents say. I mean, it was... It had a little African flavor to it, but it looked like the national defense strategy. It looked like the national security strategy. He was talking to um, his president, and he was talking to uh, the general policy thrust of this administration. And so it's it was a missed opportunity because it was this public speech to actually talk about African issues and talk about Africa in a uh, in an optimistic view, given all the things that you just mentioned, but he stuck uh, to a very narrow set of talking points, which are largely carbon copies across the region, across the globe. We hear, especially here in Kenya, uh, that competition with China and countering China uh, has really become the sort of one all-encompassing primary objective of of U.S. policy out here. 
Um, how would you describe the previous U.S. policy under the Obama administration towards Kenya? The U.S. administration under President Obama saw Kenya as a place of lots of opportunity. I mean, even in a post-ICC world, um, the U.S. government under President Obama really did elevate Kenya, and President Obama came here. And and then seeing Kenya as hopefully a a bigger leader on regional security issues. When I was in the Obama administration, um, it was about a month after the KDF, the Kenyan Defense Forces, went into Somalia. And, you know, a, a, a unprecedented mission for the Kenyans. And we worked with the Kenyans and the African Union and the AU to rehat them and support them uh, and make sure that they were working in conjunction with their partners. And so, you know, not only did the U.S. government under President Obama see them for all of the things that we have been talking about, that, but they saw them as a security partner. And then and then in South Sudan as well, great power pom- competition, I think, is a really terrible framework. And I think that we are going about these these issues the wrong way. We can all agree, or at least I feel, that there are things that China is doing that is negative uh, in Africa, that is not great for African interests, and is certainly not good for U.S. interests. But if we're framing everything as against China and against Russia, then what are our outputs going to be? I mean, everything is going to be through that prism, and we're not going to get the types of outcomes that our Kenyan partners want and that we want if we're just talking about everything anti-China. So in this region, we've seen a rather obvious power vacuum in places as the U.S. disengages, partly in this administration, but some of it's also a carryover, I would say, from the previous administration, as U.S. takes a step uh, back as the leading player in several places. I mean, I work heavily on South Sudan, um, you know, where the U.S. was for decades, the clear lead international player. I think we saw in, in Sudan where, you know, you would have expected after the fall of Bashir and, and that escalating crisis maybe a decade ago for the U.S. to, to really be out front on that. And instead, it took a while and the U.S. eventually did take a very strong role, but it, it took a little bit. In Ethiopia, we saw the new prime minister, Abi Ahmed, come in and kind of first turn, really turn to the U.S. And then later he sort of pivoted and turned more to the Gulf. Um, do you think do you think this sort of shift um, from the U.S. and the pullback was inevitable? No, I don't think it was inevitable, but I think that in certain countries, uh, the die was cast. The growing frustration with South Sudan was already apparent in the last administration. And I think that was a carryover because I don't think, right, the bureaucracy hasn't changed, Alan. So the bureaucracy has been largely disaffected um, with the South Sudanese political elite. And that's a carryover. And Let's be honest, the senior leadership of the NSC until recently and the senior leadership of the State Department on Africa are bureaucrats or former bureaucrats. And so that is a through line, certainly. On Ethiopia and and on Sudan, as I said earlier, I think that this wasn't doctrinal, right? This wasn't sort of in the Trump playbook to have to deal with these problems, but the opportunity and challenges were so immense and so obvious and so uh, in your face that they had to act. And so you are getting responses. And I was really pleased to see the Friends of Sudan meeting that happened uh, in Washington, D.C. recently. That's the kind of leadership that you want the U.S. to play in a convening role, uh, particularly when every actor has its own interest. But it has been reactive largely and in part being driven by the State Department's and the NSC and DOD's Africa leadership, and hopefully, if they're successful, pulling on more senior people, such as the Undersecretary for Political Affairs at the State Department, um, uh, Undersecretary Hale. Do you think there's a happy medium where the U.S. doesn't take the predominating role that maybe it used to, but it also doesn't pull out so rapidly that it sort of leaves a leadership vacuum when crises arrive? Yes. Here's the challenge. The two most important tools that I think we have to do any of the objectives that this administration has that they've stated or to address the, some of the problems in South Sudan and the problems in Ethiopia or challenges, opportunities, however when you, you want to say it, is multilateralism and democracy and governance. Not only do I think they're the most effective, but they actually allow you to not be in a leadership role because you can crowdsource some of these problems because you're empowering uh, local partners and to say there's an allergy to those things is unfair, but um, it is not the way in which this administration wants to c- 
conceptualize their interventions, right? We're much more unilateral. Uh, we're much more America first. And so we're seeing, like the Friends of Sudan, a, a, a very positive step towards trying to do at least the multilateral approach. Uh, but we need more of that if we want to not go all in and not be the face of this, but still achieve some of these really important objectives. One thing Crisis Group has really worked to highlight, and in fact, it was the subject of our very first podcast, was the rising influence of the Gulf powers here in the Horn of Africa. Um, I, I'm curious if you think the U.S. has a clear policy line um, or approach towards the, the rising Gulf influence here. I mean, does the U.S. welcome this? I mean, many of these are actually U.S. allies. Um, or do you think the U.S., again, is just being very reactive? I think the U.S. doesn't have a clear policy. For example, the Saudis or the Emiratis have different lines into different parts of the government, both bureaucratic and political, that um, make it difficult for you to have a coherent policy. I I believe that there is a recognition, increasing recognition, that there is a huge gulf voice in these issues, and at times they have been problematic. I look at Somalia in particular and think that here were three partners, uh, the Saudis, the Qataris, and the Emiratis, who were so critical in the famine relief and incredibly important in a multilateral approach to bring uh, the transitional government to an end and start the new government and even some of the security sector reform. Let me add the Turks too while, while I'm at it. Um, but that's all changed with the RIF. And now instead of promoting Somali progress, they have been sort of undercutting it, uh, working with uh, federal member states instead of, uh, and, and sort of alienating the federal government. So the U.S. administration seems to be trying to get their heads around this, trying to figure out how to have a relationship that is a little more critical mm -hmm. with some of the Gulf states when they're doing negative things, supporting Hameti in Sudan, or as I said, playing off ca characters and actors in Somalia. But I don't see it. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see where this heads because uh, when we speak to some of our African and European interlocutors, um, they are very much trying to um, respond to this Gulf influence. And then they also see that the U.S. is perhaps the partner who has the greatest leverage, but also just partnership with these with these Gulf allies. And so and so we really saw that on Sudan, where once the U.S. came in, it kind of opened up new pathways. I, I think it's important for your your listeners to recognize that almost every administration, uh, the secretary of state tends to say to the Africa Bureau, your job is to keep this off my desk. So when we're talking about how do we coordinate and cooperate with the Gulfs, how do we deliver hard messages when necessary? That means that the bureaucrats and the political appointees at the Africa policy level have to really spend some capital to get your secretary of state, your undersecretary, your deputy, your national security advisor to have a hard message with the Saudis to spend time on these issues. And I don't think in the Saudis, you kind of need to do it at that level. With these Gulf states, you have to be at a more senior level. Ultimately, you've got to be able to have that engagement. So the, the challenge is bringing in that top level, the finishers, the closers, and the ones that are going to say, we're going to spend time and energy and resources on this are at the top level and getting their attention to do things that in a different space may seem contradictory to our goals is really hard. I'm going to take a, a, a brief step back here. I'm wondering, you talked some about the broad history of U.S. engagement towards Africa. Is there a through line? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's something that I, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about. And the conclusion that I have reached, which may not be great to hear from those of us who spend our whole lives working in Africa, is that the geopolitical framing is always at the top, um, whether it's the Soviet Union or whether it is great power competition today. And Africa is part of that story. And good bureaucrats, good politicians, good leaders know how to inject other issues into that conversation and still have these broader outcomes. President George W. Bush, as you know, was hugely popular um, in Africa. Uh, there's a perception that I often hear among Africans and African observers that Obama in some ways actually pulled back some from from the levels that we saw from the Bush administration. A, I'm curious if you think this is 
Fair, but I, I'm also curious if you think President Obama's heritage from this region, from, from having a Kenyan father and the way that played into U.S. politics, if that actually constrained U.S. Um, engagement in this region, especially maybe perhaps in his first term. Yeah, I think there was a tremendous amount of expectations that were overinflated. How much that constrained him, I'm not sure, but certainly everyone thought, well, he's of Kenyan descent, so of course, you know, Africa is going to be at the top of his agenda. And you look at his administration, actually, particularly in term two, Susan Rice as a national security advisor who had been assistant secretary of state, Samantha Power as the uh, UN ambassador who had written a book about genocide, particularly in Rwanda, probably more Africanist in cabinet or sub-cabinet positions than in any other administration. But back to our through line, they're going to focus on these bigger issues. What I think made a difference in terms of perceptions of President Bush's administrations versus President Obama, and you're absolutely right, President Bush is still probably the most popular U.S. president in recent memory in Africa, is that President Bush had a lot more money to play with and launched these big programs like PEPFAR and MCC that in a period of budget austerity, Obama didn't have, uh, given that he came in uh, to power during you know, sort of the Great Recession, and then there was all the partisan fighting over the budget. That's just in terms of money and programming. But I actually think what Africans are really responding to is a sense of Obama's personal disengagement. And I don't think that has to do with Africa. I think that has to do with the man. You know, President Bush certainly loved to engage with people. And the Oval Office, so Kennedy, I said, met with an African leader every month, so more, more time on target than any leader, uh, any U.S. president. President Bush is a close second. I mean, he had Oval Offices all the time, and he didn't do what President Obama administration did, which obviously I worked on, which was if you're going to be in the Oval Office, the, the Oval Office was the uh, winner's circle. Uh, and President Bush didn't have that approach. President Bush invited everyone. If you were going to be the AU chair, you got an oval. You know, he was much more interested in that personal engagement um, and used that as part of his power. And President Obama, you know, much more cerebral, much more, you know, that's not really, and we, we talk about this even in domestic politics, that that's not really how he works. So I think the perception of President Bush's engagement is not just financial uh, or programmatic. It's also the perception of his, that general warmth that he had in his engagements. Uh, now we're we're nearing the end of our 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 time. I, I have a I have a few sort of rapid fire questions Go for, for you. Do peacekeeping missions work? Peacekeeping missions work if you're clear about what they're trying to do, which is freeze the conflict and start the policy process. They're not for solving, ending conflict. They're about freezing conflict so you can do the politics. So I think they remain to. They can, at their basic core, do that, but we have larded on so many different objectives with them to be counterterrorism, to be all these other things that I think it's unfair, and there's not been the commiserate increase in the diplomacy side. As a follow-up, then, do you think there's some validity in the Trump administration's uh, approach towards trying to pull back some from these peacekeeping forces that have been there for a very long time? I think that the instinct to relook at peacekeeping is warranted and welcome. I think that cutting troop levels is not the solution is actually reconceptualizing what they're trying to do and then investing in the other parts of peacemaking, which is diplomacy, which is development, which is multilateralism. Will the U.S. ever be ready to accept a Taliban-style negotiation with al-Shabaab in Somalia, like the one that we've seen in Afghanistan? Well, I can only say what I hope, and I hope that they will embrace sort of a Taliban negotiation. I think most experts across the you know, all across uh, both in Africa, U.S., Europe, believe that that is the right approach. And so it's going to probably rest on the success of the Taliban uh, negotiations for sort of a, a proving ground for this. But I hope that's where we'll ultimately go. Do you think the U.S. appreciates the, the gravity of the political crisis uh, unraveling right now in Ethiopia? I think, and this gets back to this point, this sort of sub-theme throughout this, I think the Africanists do. I think that we have not done enough to engage with Abi. I think that it's been very hard to present a nuanced picture of what's happening in Ethiopia. And I think that the fact that Abi has gotten essentially just a pull aside with Pence tells you uh, that the whole whole of government and the champions that we need aren't 
fully engaged in Ethiopia in the way that almost any administration would, given how incredibly important this moment is. Last question. Uh, If you could wave a magic wand and change one thing about uh, the previous administration, Obama administration's uh, approach towards this region or Africa in general, and if you could do the same with the current administration, what would you change? Okay, well, for the Obama administration, I think there needed to be a reconceptualization of the president's role. I think that we needed to realize that South Africa and Ethiopia and Sudan and Nigeria, let me just name a couple of big countries to be inclusive, these are not countries that do everything that we want them to do. They're not going to be democratic darlings all the time. But our interests lie in engagement with them. And we need to recognize that when we pick winners and losers, we tie our hands, we create false narratives, and we can't ignore them just because they're not doing things that sort of seem like the whatever, the the, the right way to do things. So I thought that there was a little too much focus on naming and faming and creating some of this demonstrative effect and not saying like, damn it, we need to be able to work with South Africa and they're a difficult partner, but so much goes through Pretoria or name a country. So I think that's on the Obama side. On the Trump administration, democracy and diplomacy, multilateralism is our best tools to achieve our objectives. And if we want to talk about great power competition, let's let Africans lead on that issue. Africans have a fairly nuanced view of China. They see positives and negatives. But if you want to expose malfeasance or maligned influence, it's African journalists. It's legislative oversight. It's courts. And like, why do we why are we leaving that tool on the off the table and multilateralism? The Turks are just as worried about China as we are. The South Koreans are. Why aren't we creating a, a sort of a general sort of consensus around these issues so that it's not just us? And so I, I obviously think that we should be doing more in democracy and governance for its own sake. But I believe that if this is the objectives they want to achieve, why are they leaving their most powerful tools off the table? Judd, enjoy the rest of your time in Nairobi, and thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. The Horn is a podcast from International Crisis Group. You can find our reports and sign up for our newsletter at crisisgroup.org. This episode was produced by Mae Francis. 